Hello, everybody. I'm Lucas Pardu. I'm a senior software engineer at Cloudflare, and I'm co-chair of the IETF Quick Working Group. And today I'm going to be talking to you about HTTP3 and Quick. I'm going to tell you what those things are. So we'll, we'll start with some basic uh, understanding, and then we'll get you up to speed on what they mean for the, the internet and the web today. Uh, but, but really, the focus of this talk is going to be about why they're open standards, what that means, and how the development of open standards in the IETF which I'll explain what that is uh, soon, um, how that goes hand in hand with open source code or code that runs but interoperates in a way that's kind of open. And the tools and the technologies that we in the Quick Working Group, who are a coll collection of a bunch of people from all over the world, uh, different organizations or individuals have contributed to the standards development. Um, so just before we begin, I'd like to remind people that uh, this webinar is recorded and that the video will be shared via email and posted on the DigitalOcean YouTube channel and the DigitalOcean community um, afterwards. So you should get those details, don't worry about it too much. Um, it'll all be in control. So uh, there is an ability to ask questions to me. Um, I'm gonna, I've got a lot of slides, so I'm going to try and have a balance of time between these two things. I want to inform you, but I also don't want to lecture you too much because uh, there's a lot of built-in assumptions to things and sometimes getting those assumptions wrong or, or going through them too fast means that people lack the understanding of the more interesting stuff that we'll get to at the end. So I want to start by apologizing if you already know what things like HTTP are, but getting that core basics down is really important for the latter half of the talk, so do bear with me. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe pause after about 15, 20 minutes just to check that people are okay. Um, and, and see if there's any questions that we can address quickly at that point before moving on. So I just want to start by uh, moving on to the next slide. HTTP, what is it? Um, what does it mean? Like you could spend hours upon hours about just talking about HTTP. It goes back decades. And we'll explore a bit of the, the history of it uh, shortly. But for, for me, what, I, what will help me talk here about it is to just say it's it's an acronym, like many technologies in the internet. What it stands for is hypertext transfer protocol. Well, that doesn't really matter. The thing that's important is to understand it's a stateless request and response protocol. What that means is you have a client and a server that talk to each other. The client initiates a connection to the server. So it's the thing that's responsible for creating the, the context between two things. And that the client then makes a request and the server does something with that request and provides a response. It might say, okay, great, uh, here's the thing you asked for, or sorry, I can't do that. Um, and, and that's as much as we might need to know. We'll get into some details next, but, but the, the main thing that's important for HTTP is that it requires a transport that can deliver things reliably. It's important that when the client sends that request to the server, it gets there. And it's important that when the server responds, that that response gets there too. Um, you, you might argue, well, maybe I could just give up. You know, I'll, I'll send a request and wait for a while. And if, if it doesn't happen, if I don't get anything back, I'll just try again or something. And, that, and those kind of timeout retry mechanisms are there. But fundamentally, you need to build assumptions about how your, your application layer is going to respond. By making assumptions, you can simplify the complexity of design. And so HTTP, in every normal usage that we're going to talk about, uh, requires something reliable underneath it. Um, and you might think about what that transport protocol is today, um, and we'll talk about what it could be tomorrow. Uh, but at a, at a very abstract level, it, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, but to visualize what things look like. Uh, I've got some animations. I apologize if these are a bit janky. Um, I haven't tested them. They're not going to make the full basis of this talk, so don't worry too much. Uh, I'll talk around them. And maybe maybe in the YouTube capture it'll be smoother, uh, but don't worry. Just think here on the left-hand side we have a client, and it's going to make this request. This is an example of a, a 1.1 request, which is just a verb like get um, and and a resource that the client would like. So get me index.html and and the host name is example.com. Don't worry too much about that, but that is. Um, let's just say valid good syntax. And in response, the server is going to get this request and send it back. It's a bit like a Pong match, right? You're sending one thing, the server is going to come and anticipate 
catch the ball, process it, and send it back. Uh, but if anyone who plays Pong as, or has ever played Pong knows the client should move and it should attempt to catch this return message. Without the reliability, that message won't get captured and handed back to the user. The user is the important person in all of this, whether they're looking at that text or HTML file themselves or whether they, uh, their web browser is going to process it for them. It needs to, to get that thing in order to do anything meaningful to a user. And so what we need is this reliable protocol underneath. And the one that we're familiar with is something called TCP, which stands for the Transmission Control Protocol. Um, and what that provides is a reliable delivery thing that we've been talking about, but also in order delivery. So this is the a single byte stream that delivers everything that it receives uh, in the, the order that it was received it, which is partially true. Maybe there can be things in the network that happen, uh, which I'll show later. But, but we don't care about what happens at the network. We have to care about what HTTP is presented with. What it, it, it can rely on is TCP giving everything in the order that the sender sent it in, not the order it was received in. Uh, and these subtle differences uh, play a big part in uh, people who geek out on transport protocols like myself and, and my uh, friends across the industry who have spent the last five, six, seven, or maybe decades of their life on these topics. Um, and the other thing you might be familiar with is, is TLS or transport layer security. And this is kind of or, orthogonal to, to the reliable delivery aspect, but it's something that's very important in the modern world where um, we're more security conscious or security aware. Uh, TLS is an ability to add authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality to internet communications. And you know, at a very basic level, you might just think, oh yeah, if I type in HTTP colon slash slash, I'll talk just TCP. But if I want a secure session, I'll, I'll type HTTPS, which will give me a combination of TCP and TLS that uh, can contain HTTP messages and make them safe from observers on the internet. Uh, there's more complications there. There's clever stuff like uh, automatic redirects or strict transport security. We don't need to care about those for these kinds of talks, but they are interesting communications. And it's worth reiterating that there's many versions of, of TCP, say, or TCP and extensions. There's different versions of HTTP, and there's different versions of TLS as well. So you, if you are somebody who configures web services, you might have to support uh, older versions of TLS, something known as SSL. but I think as the years go by, that, that happens less. The most recent version of TC TLS that we have today is, is 1.3, um, and that's important to understand what it means in relation to Quick. So just keep that one in mind. And what's new? We talk about the older stuff. I wouldn't call it old, even though it is, but it, it's older. We're focused on the future for this talk. So the new thing is we have a HTTP 3. Um, and all this does is simply describe how to speak HTTP over the Quick Transport Protocol. So what's Quick? Uh, this is IETF Quick. You might have been familiar with Quick from say five years ago, uh, which has been colloquially renamed as G Quick. So this was something that Google started with and, and played with in Chrome and their web services and demonstrated that there could be an improvement to how people access websites or services on the web. Um, and that transitioned into the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, to take on the task of standardizing the work. And we'll dig into to that. That's a core topic for this session. Uh, but what does it do? Like, what does it provide? So IETF Quick provides a secure transport itself. You can get the security at that layer without having to, to layer on this, this TLS on the top. They're related, but they're slightly different. And that's something that's a bit um, tricky for some people to get their head around, depending on how familiar they are with TLS as it already works. Um, and it also provides a reliability. And those two things together uh, make it a suitable replacement for TCP. So it can carry application protocols like HTTP. Uh, the important thing to know is that Quick runs on top of UDP. We call it its own transport protocol, but for the real experts in the room that are familiar with how 
transport protocols or IP protocols work at all. Uh, it's not strictly a transport protocol with an enumeration and a code point. It's a transport protocol that re-implements many aspects of TCP on top of UDP, which is a, 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 a very simple transport protocol in itself. And the reason it does this is, is for a few reasons. Uh, it makes it easier to experiment and iterate. UDP is supported across many devices on the internet already. And so if you put things in, inside it or on top of it, uh, you, can, you can try them out without needing to say, go in and, and need a, a firewall or uh, different kinds of network equipment and try and make them understand a new protocol and configure it in a way that would allow that through firewalls or et cetera. UDP isn't like default supported sometimes in firewalls. You might find that uh, TCP is, and when you try to make a UDP connection to a server on the internet, it would get blocked. But at least your equipment would have a view or uh, an API that might let you configure that. It's all in your control. And so if you don't want quick block it, you can do that. But uh, I would like to encourage people to think about the, some of the opportunities that Quick can provide and, and that it's good. And one of those main opportunities is, is mitigation of head of line blocking. Um, and, and this is one of the, the core values for HTTP. So I'll talk about that in a few slides. But, but what do we do? We, we talked about these request response messages and we talked about Quick and HP3. And you can think of this layering up of things. You know, if you if you don't like text, do you like cake? So I'll show you a cake. And at the bottom, we've got UDP and we've got quick on the top of that. We've got this HTTP3 syntax, how we convert uh, a verb like get and a path like index.html and, and encode that in a way that can fit inside the quick packet. So that's what these different layers of the cake are trying to represent. People love OSI diagrams or whatever, and there's lots of ways to draw them. They're always a bit of a con, you know, there's always some assumption or blending of layers that you need to do. And it depends on, on who you're talking to and what you're trying to communicate. So this is one way to do things. You might have a different way that you like to look at stuff. You can see I don't show TLS in this and some people like to put that in there. TLS is used for uh, creating quick handshakes. Um, it's not used for protecting the quick packets when they're sent in transmission. And to give you a brief history of HTTP. I can't go into that in, during this talk. I spent a good few weeks digging into this for a blog post on Cloudflare and had great fun. But I just want to use this to show you that uh, although HTTP 3 is new, it still reuses so many of the core principles that go back to you know the early 90s when we had what was known as HTTP 0.9, which is like a non-IETF standard um, uh, that was published by uh, people and it, it worked. The important thing is it worked and people were able to try this thing out, build client and servers, get actual running code and experience. And from that, uh, other people got involved. They they had users and they, they found an ability or, or things that they wanted to help improve and capture in a, in a spec. And so this is focused on 1.1, HP 1.1. You can see there's been many, many documents here. So I just want to dig into what those documents mean. So then the terminology I want to use for this is uh, a specification, which is just a written document. It doesn't need to be a special standards defining organization thing. It could just be if you have an idea for a protocol, you could write it up in, in HTML or in a text file and stick it up onto GitHub if you wanted to, because you might want to, you might develop something you think is useful and someone says, that sounds cool. How can I write uh, the equivalent myself in a different language? And you would, you could do this via a specification. And the standard is, is taking that to the next level effectively. So the point of a standard is to define common terms, define a common set of constraints or scope and applicability. Um, just so it's not focused on one use case, but that the technology is applicable to a range of things that people understand that and scoping is very important there. And these kinds of standards are published by many different groups with many different processes. There's even a standard for you know, uh, making tea. You might argue is that important or not, but for some people it is. So we shouldn't necessarily rate too much. But the ones I want to talk about today are, uh, are documents called internet drafts and documents called RFCs. So an internet draft is is an IETF term 
it's often the first step in getting a specification standardized. So you might take something that you've written in a Google Doc to share with people and say, hey, I think there's some interest here taking this even further. I'm going to convert that into an internet draft format and then uh, try and solicit some feedback from the world. Um, and to do that, I would publish the internet draft. Um, but it's important to realize that although the IETF provide tools to, to both uh, publish and archive those documents, those things aren't standards. Unless they're adopted by a group, and unless they're published as an RFC, even then that might not mean they're standards. That might just mean they're an idea or an informational document that, that some other group of people have thought it was useful to document. So buyer beware, whenever you're reading these things, try and check the fine print to understand is this just some random idea somebody's had and it's an old document that never went anywhere? Is this something that's being actively deployed? Um, those kinds of things. And you can see in some of the previous slides, we've got these kind of weird, unique namings, terms. So the important thing to realize is that the way that the IETF likes to work is in immutable drafts. Uh, it's a bit different to things like W3C or what WG that publish living documents. Um, in the IETF, they like to publish one version of the thing. And if you need to update that, if you found a typo or you wanted to add some extra information, you need to publish a new draft. So in this case, if you're looking at things, a draft will always start with draft at the front. That's probably obvious. Then you might have the next field is an author name. Um, and then you might have a working group if that work applies to uh, a special group or not. So here we, we're talking HTTP or quick, but you might have other things uh, like TLS, for instance. Um, and then you've got a name and a version. Pretty simple. Uh, so an RFC comes in um, where they they are also immutable, but they have a name and a number, or, or the name is the number. And these just effectively pick the next available number after all of the previous RFCs. And you've, you've probably heard this in common talk or parlance that, you know, uh, RFC 7838, yes, I know what that is. Like, some people do, some people don't. So interchangeably, we'll use uh, either an RFC name or the name of the technology that's being referred to, just like I did with TLS 1.3 earlier. Uh, and we have here, for instance, HB 1.1 was published as RFC 1945. But the, the difficulty you might have is that people like to refactor things. You know, we like to rewrite code or, or see the improvements in doing things. And so we're not changing the API or what what this actual thing is, what we're doing is rewriting it to read more clearly. And so sometimes RFCs overtake other ones, they replace them as a new version. But again, because they're immutable, they, they don't replace them as in, you can visit the same link to the same document with the same name. It's, uh, it's, it's something that can be a bit tricky for people to get used to, but that's the world that we live in. And so, yeah. Just to reiterate, RFCs are kind of the final point in the road after a very long process of getting an ID adopted and iterated upon and working through the consensus of the group and so forth. And what is a working group? Uh, this is more, just, more or less just a mailing list that's focused on a particular topic. So we have different working groups for HTTP quick and TLS, and, and quite often these technologies do work hand in hand, and there can be a crossover of, of interest and also population. So if you see somebody like me who is a co-chair of the Quick Working Group, I'm also a, a, a member of HTTP, say. So I have some drafts there that I'm working on with collaborators, uh, but I also i am a spectator in other groups where I might be interested but not have the time or expertise to contribute actively, uh, but that I want to take away information that might uh, be relevant to my working group or my employer, these kinds of things. And so I mentioned RFC 1945. This was a draft in the HTTP working group. If you go on to uh, the ITF's tools, uh, at the top of each document, they'll have this kind of view to show you the history of how the document progressed from an ID into an RFC. This is good from a very um, mandrolic process perspective of, oh, this draft was published at this time. You can lose a lot of the history and the context about why those things happened. Uh, those things are generally captured on the mailing lists as well. So a lot of the 
the work of open standards is not just to capture the output, but to, to help archive and document the uh, process by which decisions were made so that people can, if they're inclined, go back in time and determine them. The specification often says what and doesn't go into the explanations of why, and, and that helps the specifications be brief and to the point. Uh, but the tooling is there to help you understand if you are a protocol archiver or an archaeologist like myself. And so going back to the blog post that I did, that's what I did. And I tried to take the history of every one of those IDs and RFC and plot them all on one big chart. So we looked at the standardization of 1.1. There's the refactor of HTTP to rewrite it. And today we have RFC 7230 series of documents which reflect HTTP 1.1 as it is today. And again, those things are even being worked on now. Um, we, we have a, a family or a piece of work called HTTP Core that's trying to pull apart the common aspects of HTTP from the 1.1 specific pieces. And this is important because it helps us have clarity of communication when we're talking about things like HTTP 2 and HTTP 3. But we talked about TLS and SSL and how that progressed through different versions from specifications that were non-ITF into ITF ROCs up to kind of the modern day. And so, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about TCP and TLS and, and how that works. But I'll just take a pause to look at some of the questions. Um, we've got one from uh, says, oh no, I think some of these have been answered already. Uh, the one that hasn't, um, is it possible to use HB3 right now in production? So uh, this this relates to some slides I'll get onto later, but it's a great question because part of the, the whole standardization process is to work on implementation while you're also developing the specification. So uh, using things in production can mean a few different things for people. Uh, does it mean, can I use it in a web browser? Well, that uh, different web browsers have different teams and different priorities, of course, but uh, they, we've seen support for HTTP and Quick in, uh, say, Chrome Beaters or Chrome Nightlies and Firefox Nightlies for, for a while now, maybe about a year or so um, or, or longer, because Chrome's been supporting Google Quick. Um, so yes, you can, those browsers go in and enable some kind of experimental flags. And I've got some examples of that at the end, uh, but then what web servers do you test them against? And so uh, speaking for Cloudflare, we've offered HTTP3 as a generally available service um, since September, 2019, um, using our own implementation, which I'll mention later on. Uh, and other, you know, other services like Google, who have a lot of experience with Quick, uh, have also provided some of those things. Uh, but it's not unilateral. People will be testing and progressing at their own rate of, of progress. So maybe not right now, is it universally available, but because of the way that the core documents are progressing towards an RFC and that we've got more confidence in the design of the protocol, you'll see more people starting to experiment. Um, and you know, we might have seen the news recently that Chrome Stable has enabled HTTP3 by default. So it will try, if it understands that a server can talk HTTP3, it will. We just need kind of the server side of the world to, to raise their support. Uh, but there's not there's not a huge rush here. Um, you need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that this is a new transport protocol. As much as HTTP2 was was a hard to transition to for its own reasons, mainly around TLS and, and negotiation at that phase, um, that uh, having a brand new transport protocol, while really exciting, it, it it also brings its own concerns. So you have not just the people like me who develop the the HTTP3 layer, say, but the entire team of network engineers who do a fantastic job of handling all the stuff about internet working that I don't understand to make sure that those systems behave uh, reliably and that they scale properly and that they're resistant to DDoS attacks and all of these concerns that sometimes we take for granted. So it takes a village to develop and deploy anything like this. Um, and I just, yeah. This is a great opportunity to thank everyone that's been involved, both 
from from Cloudflare, but also the entire internet community. And the job's not done. You know, we're just getting started here. So I'm going to go back to TCP. We we, we had our bouncing ball example, but you know, what 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 does a HTTP request that goes over TCP and TLS look like? Uh, the client, as I mentioned, has to start the handshake. It has to uh, open a connection, a, a HTTP connection, which relies on a TCP connection and a TLS session. So we have this back and forth, sin, sinac, ack, hello, hello, finished, request response. There's a lot of back and forth there that you have to wait just to be able to send your GET request. And those back and forth have to travel across the internet, the subject to delays, um, you know, if we were to plot this out in a computer game example, this red line indicates kind of my notion of a TCP and TLS barrier that has to be overcome before the server can receive the HTTP request and ultimately send it back to the client. And again, in this case, the client's being a bit dumb. Although it's moving its paddle slowly for the initial parts, it doesn't catch a HTTP request. That's sad, that sucks, because you go to all this effort and maybe something on the internet comes and it zaps, it zaps your communication. The packets are dropped somewhere along the network, which means although the client and the server did all of this work uh, to get to the point that they can make a request or even the, receive the request and have the server do some work, ultimately the client's left there waiting, thinking what, what the heck happened? Like I, I'm just waiting for my request. And so to avoid that kind of situation, uh, again, using these awful gaming analogies, say that uh, a client would open multiple connections, multiple TCP connections that progress at different rates because they're talking across different internet paths maybe, or they're just lucky. And so the first request gets zapped, but the second one makes it. And this is a, what happens in practice that with HP 1.1 using TCP, say that uh, in order to, to mitigate some of the problems around web performance and some of the problems around networking, uh, we would find that browsers would open many TCP connections to a web server in order to load different resources, to load them in parallel, or just to avoid some of the problems of the network. And that's fine, like that's a good strategy, but it's unfortunate because TCP, it's not a very good use of TCP, right? Um, and it, it, from a server perspective, from somebody who works on the server side of things, every one of those connections consumes a resource. It can uh, it takes up memory in the kernel or it, it takes up uh, different mappings of the way that we need to do load balancing and routing of TCP connections back and forth to a client. And so that's part motivation for why HTTP2 came in. It's not the only one. This is a very contrived story that I'm telling you. But um, if we imagine that it is, then it all links up nicely. And so what we want with one TCP connection is to save server resource, but we need the ability to multiplex multiple requests and responses in a single connection, because that was part of the reason that 1.1 uh, clients were making multiple connections in the first place. And so to do that, we take our, our existing message and we frame it. We, we put it into something that isn't just a series of, of ASCII characters with carriage return new lines separating out the different components of those messages. We put them into a binary frame. So although this looks like text, it's um, it's encoded in a slightly different way when we look at that, which we're not going to do here because that would take another hour. So you just imagine that when you make a request without a body, you put it in a headers frame and this is how it would look abstractly, um, although that's quite close. That would be something that you would see in say Wireshark, for instance. And so the return message that just says, okay, and then does send you the payload of hello or whatever it was, um, is gonna appear as a sequence of two frames, a headers and a data frame. And there's a whole bunch of other frames at HTTP2 that we don't need to care about here. Uh, and we might imagine in this Pong example that we send a request in one frame and the server replies with multiple frames back. So rather than a pong ball, we've got a kind of snake thing coming back. And in order to send those frames and make sure that that they they work properly and that they can be multiplexed, we have this concept of streams. And streams provide reliable delivery um, and in order delivery on each stream. That's cool, right? That maps very well to TCP. Uh, yeah, great. 
And so we can send multiple requests and, and receive a sequence of interleaved frames from the server back to the client. The client captures them in this case, and it can process them. It doesn't matter what order those frames come back in because they have a stream identifier. The client is able to say, oh, this piece of data is related to this request. I'm going to maybe buffer that up until the whole thing comes in. Or oh, this thing is a progressive image. I can show that incrementally and load it up on the page as it arrives. And this is kind of all of the complexity and cleverness of HTTP2. And then we need to think about head of line blocking. So uh, this is having multiple TCP connections means if you lose some data on one, you can progress on the other one. That's cool. The danger or the risk with H2 is even, even though we save some resources, that putting everything into one connection has a danger that losing some piece in the middle blocks all of the data behind it. The data will always get there because of the way that TCP works. But uh, it's sad when you have a piece of HTML that is there and it's in your local received TCP buffer, but you're not allowed to read it because you're waiting for some frames of data um, beforehand. And so uh, the, this notion of streams and the problem of head of line blocking is a motivating factor for quick which uh, basically takes them and pulls them down into the transport layer. So it's going to provide you reliable delivery and in order delivery on a stream, but it's going to allow independent delivery between streams, something that TCP can't do and will never be able to do, uh, which is why we need a new transport layer. And then to visualize what that might look like, you know, in this case, if, if a packet or a, a frame of stream data gets lost, it doesn't block the remaining ones behind it. In this case, the green request is able to progress and the client will receive the data and, and move on. And this can this can improve performance in practice, but it's not the only thing. Um, and so if we were to look at how a client initiates a HTTP request over QUIC, we don't have the TCP and the TLS. We have a QUIC handshake, which is a, a more compacted form because QUIC uses TLS 1.3 in a, you know, a an integrated manner, say, um, more so than TCP and TLS, which were more clearly layered. And so that speeds up handshaking. And I kind of covered some of this already. Uh, just going to take a quick look at any questions that might have come in. Some really good ones so far. I will um, maybe save these for the end uh, because that looks like something for a wider conversation. But they're good, so keep on, keep them coming in. Uh, so I kind of covered some of this slide already. Where did it start? It started at Google. There's community interest in the idea. You know, they publish some blog posts, which were cool. We love blog posts, right? Um, and in 2015, they wrote an ID. They wrote this thing to submit into the, the TSVWG, which is a transport area working group called the Quick Protocol. And, and there was some early feedback here that it's like, this looks cool. Uh, we have some ideas as a community for things you would probably want to change in design or we need more details to understand stuff like you've written this because you understand it but if I want to read this thing for the first time I need more details in there in order to maybe write my own kind of implementation here without needing to look at your code and so uh, basically come back with more and we'll consider it then so in 2016 uh, Google people um, along with well Martin Thompson, uh, who wrote some clever TLS stuff, basically uh, came back with a family of documents, one that describes how the transport protocol works, one that describes how it integrates with the TLS to provide a secure handshake, another document that describes how you detect losses and, and recover from them, and then the fourth, which was a HTTP2 mapping, so a way to describe how to carry HTTP messages over quick, um, as it was then, then using HTTP2 frames. And so we needed to figure out what working group to do this quick work in. Um, one way to do that is to hold a birds of a feather meeting. So at a, an all hands kind of IETF meeting that happens three times a year, these birds of a feather uh, tend to congregate and, and discuss the scope of problems, uh, how that might be fixed, what other ideas are out there. Um, and there's too much to go into here, but the outcome for this was that we should form a new working group call quick that would focus on uh, solving the problem in a way similar to what those documents described, but that we would adopt and develop them and engage the community to make sure that 
the design work for different kinds of actors, different kinds of stakeholders, not just Google, but people who want to implement things maybe in hardware or people who have a web browser with a completely different processing model. And so that they might need to, to challenge core assumptions or design details in a way that doesn't fundamentally change quick, but that makes it work in a, in a more common way. And so going back to my blog post again, uh, you can see this whole history of, of Google Quick and Quick Crypto and GQuick and how it relates to Speedy and, and all of these documents. But the, the important thing that I want to get across is that there's the Quick protocol in HTTP3 are defined as a set of documents that we've been working group, uh, that we've been working on for a while. And, and then I'm going to describe how we've been doing that. How a working group works, it depends. Not all working groups want to work in the same way that Quick does. Um, some have, you know, they just have success using email and posting patches in that way or updating the documents and referring to sections by their number or paragraphs or things like that. Uh, but the way that the Quick Working Group does it is it has a GitHub repo. Each internet draft is written as a markdown file. Um, we're able to publish that using some tooling that I'll talk about in a few couple of slides, uh, but we track issues in the documents, problems, or ideas for improvement as new issues on GitHub. People can still talk on the mailing list. That's quite good for a longer form, but uh, yeah, issues help us keep track of exactly what people are doing. It's very good for archiving, say, and it's very good for filing PRs that address those issues because you can have a linkage between the discussion of something and then the, the text that got planted into the document that addresses that. Um, and you know, the repo is public, it's an open standard, it's developed in the open. Where are those documents headed? Well, you know, just a week ago or under a week ago, they were submitted to IETF last call. Um, and what this means is that through lots of rounds of, of draft iteration, we were up to 29, um, which is a very solid protocol design. Um, that people have implemented widely, and that's one we see a lot on the internet today. Uh, and even then, we're finding kind of editorial improvements in the documents uh, through different rounds of review. Um, but where we're at now is that draft 32 has been submitted to the ITF last call, which means that as a group, we're very happy with how things are, and we're widening this out to the rest of the ITF to take a look at and to provide us some feedback. We don't anticipate any major changes to the protocol here because over the last four years, we've been developing and testing this thing. Uh, but you know, we should expect in November time to have collected all of that feedback and to address it and to potentially have a new draft um, or you know, start on the pathway to requesting that the document goes through the RFC process, which is a different thing. But ultimately, at the end of it, what Quick and HP3 are um, is uh, very close to what the documents are that you see today and close to what a lot of implementations are able to do. And so I mentioned the markdown format. For us, the markdown is source. And so the, the internet drafts are published by submitting not the source, but submitting XML to the ITS data tracker tool. That's the kind of the canonical format that um, the ITF like to use because XML is amazing. And the data tracker takes the job of converting that into different output formats like text or HTML or PDF, and it hosts and archives them, as I've mentioned. And so what you can do is uh, say, leverage the great work of Martin Thompson here to uh, bootstrap your own internet draft template, say, create your own repo, um, and uh, write a document with your ideas in, for instance, in Markdown. So it's quite simple. There's a particular flavor that they use, which takes some getting used to, but you can just hammer out your ideas, um, hit make, and you'll have uh, locally a, a HTML file and a document that look like an ID or an RFC you might have read on the internet yourselves. Uh, what's cool about this template is it's leveraged GitHub Actions recently, so you can add uh, continuous integration so that it hosts itself a, a live version of an internet draft, which is a great way to say to people, look, I've, I've made this thing, the most up-to-date copy is, is on, on the internet. I'm not ready to submit it to the IETF yet. I want to 
maybe get some peer review first, but it's in a format that you're familiar with. And this, like, for somebody used to Markdown like me, this is a very nice, quick way of, of getting up to speed. The older methods of trying to manually write XML were a bit scary. And so, you know, we're not the only people to use GitHub uh, through through some experimentation and, and trying things out and seeing what worked and what didn't work. Uh, people came up with some ideas of best practice or guidance. And so in the ITF, there's usually an RFC for everything. Um, and there's even a working group that was formed to help describe how other working groups should use GitHub. Um, you can go and look at these RFCs that describe the guidance there. Uh, that's, that's fun. But that's enough about specifications. Uh, we want to think about interoperability too that I've been talking about. Yeah. It's important to prove what's written down can be implemented. It's very easy to take a design doc. So yeah, that should be easy. Um, if you can't change the document at that stage, the danger is you find something in the implementation that just doesn't work. You, you took one person without much code experience, maybe in a particular kind of language or runtime that just thought, yeah, that'd be fine. And uh, unfortunately, while it's fine, it's maybe not performant in a certain kind of paradigm. So uh, it's important to get implementation or running code alongside uh, these standards activities, say. Uh, and the, another important factor is that different implementers, maybe people with different backgrounds who have different worldviews, you know, different life experiences, how they read documents, English might not be their native language. It's important to make sure that that document states things clearly and as concisely as possible and in a way that minimizes interpretation of, of reading the document in different ways because that's where interoperability things happen. Um, you know, examples of that could be that a web browser uh, thinks there's one way of communicating with a web server and, and if they disagree, it causes a catastrophic failure and a connection would break. Uh, that can happen, it has happened in our testing. Um, typically when we change versions and the design changes slightly and someone didn't quite catch that um, and didn't implement the code update, it's an easy fix, but without um, an ability to, to detect and measure that, bad stuff can happen. Ultimately, it's for the end user. If you try and load a web page and it just shows a blank page or a dinosaur jumping up and down, it's it's pretty sad. If you can mitigate that and have some, say, fallbacks, those things kind of improve, but those are typically outside the scope of the ITF. So we've been doing a lot of work on implementation over the last few years. This um, slide is just taken from the wiki page we have on the, the Quick Working Group uh, GitHub that covers some open source implementations to, to take a quick survey. We've got things written in Python, a lot of C implementations. So there's some implementations in Rust and, and they offer maybe as you know a basic command line client or these things are libraries that you can integrate into your own projects. And what we've been doing over the course of, of time, as I've been mentioning, is testing these things against each other. And so what this is, is a very complicated grid showing you uh, clients and servers testing different protocol features against each other, remarking whether they succeeded or failed, or they just weren't tested at all. And this was a grid that was manually populated by people. That was kind of a very work intensive uh, process. Even if you were able to script up some of the testing, getting this um, the results back into the spreadsheet could be a problem if for some reason the permissions of the spreadsheet changed one day. And it required coordination of people needing to make sure that say a web server that is on the internet they, they can talk to that day that there isn't some incident on the network causing an outage um, and so some people had ideas for a better way of doing this and martin zeman um, is a guy who's been working closely with others on developing an automated interoperability uh, capability uh, that you see here which is again a grid of, of a lot of information i encourage you to go and test like check this out if you care about interoperability testing, because what this does is define using open source, a way of creating a Docker environment that tests clients and servers against each other. And this runs in an automated fashion, uh, running every, well, multiple times a day, basically, recording the results here with detailed logs. And this is an excellent tool for people to say, oh, there's a red square here, what, what was the problem there? I'll click through, I'll look at the logs, 
I'll communicate with the, the implementation I failed against and we'll come to a solution and quickly fix a bug. It's a very helpful tool. So I talked about Quiche. I can't, well, did I? I don't know. But Quiche is a, a open source implementation of Quick that is from Cloudflare. It's written in Rust and it has a C API. And so we use the Rust and C API in an integration with Nginx uh, to run our HB3 support in the Edge. Um, pretty easy, right? Uh, but that's quite an advanced use case, say. A lot of people just want to try out, say, a client and a server just to say, like, I want to open Wireshark and understand how this handshake works at all. I, I want to see the packets on the wire. And so if, if that's you, a quick way to do this would be to clone that repo, go into our tools directory, build it. Um, of course, you need all the prerequisites like Rust. The, the repo describes these things. Um, but then from there, you would run the Quiche server first, which is going to run on localhost, and then you would run the client um, to connect to that thing. And these commands are, are very verbose. But if you were to run it in this way, the cool thing is that we capture uh, this this queue log format, which I'll explain in a couple of slides, but we, we turn on all the tracing and we turn on a, a key log file, which means you're dumping out the session key so that Wireshark will be able to dissect all of this information. If you didn't want to use the Quiche client, you could use curl. Curl has support for HTTP3 through different backends, um, either Quiche or NGTCP2. There's instructions you need to go and read for this because it can be a bit tricky. But once you've built that, you can just pass a flag or, or this alt service flag and connect to an endpoint and, and give it a go. And again, that should have its different levels of logging to show you things. Um, I mentioned Wireshark. You can download a, an automated nightly build if you're on the correct platform. If you're on Linux, like me, unfortunately, you have to go and build this thing from source, which can be a bit tricky. Um, but once you've done it once, it's probably OK. Uh, this is a whole topic in itself of how to build and use Wireshark. Maybe you're not familiar. I, I, I apologize. I can't go into that today. But if you have a version that will dissect um, quick and dissect a version of quick that you're talking, you can go in and you could just apply a filter quickly. And you can see that there's different, um, different kinds of quick packets. We've got here, it's very small to read and probably too blurry, but we've got initial packets, read five packets, handshake packets, and then protected payload packets. And someone like me can look at this and kind of quickly understand maybe what's going right, what's going wrong, what application data is being exchanged between the two. But that's not all. You would have seen also at the start of those lines that we've got a Q-log um, dumping capability. And Q-log is uh, something that's been developed for a few years by a chap called Robin Marks and some of his cohorts at Hasselt University along with other contributions from the community. And what they've done is kind of the two-factor approach of uh, defining a common logging format um, that's in like a JSON-like scheme, and then building tooling that can consume that format and give you important or very useful uh, visualizations of how quick endpoints communicate. So if you go to this website, like it has some demos built in, you can just have a play and, a, and some examples. Um, the first one was like a sequence diagram. This one is a, a view of congestion control, which is really important for the, the geeks that like this aspect of things. I'm less bothered, personally. I prefer looking at stream data. Streams are what carry HTTP requests and responses. And so this example shows how stream data gets multiplexed. Um, so how a server, say, decides to, when it has multiple requests come in, how it decides to feed those back to the client. And that's an important topic for prioritization, which is the internet draft I'm working on in the HTTP working group. And so kind of trying to come to a close on this, like I said, there's some good interest in Cloudflare blogs. I, I recommend you go and read on this topic. You could go into our dashboard if you have an account and then turn it on yourself and test it with Chrome or Firefox or any one of the kind of user agents that are out there. And what you're looking for when you turn this thing on um, is this use of alt service, this RFC 7838 uh, I mentioned before. Um, and so this will be a, a response header um, that has HB3 in it and the draft version that I talked about. 
um, and some other information. It's it's kind of all there. It's a bit boring to be honest. But if it looks like that, you you will see the port number that Quick is running on effectively. Uh, and yeah, you could then turn it on in Firefox through the About Config page and uh, just run it. Or if you want some additional logging out of Firefox itself, you could run it from a command line like that. Uh, if if this is working, say for blog.cloudflare, you can also enable the protocol column in your dev tools and see HB3 there. Um, that's cool. You could do this in Chrome. Like I mentioned, Chrome stable now even supports HB3 by default, um, albeit you know, we're still experimenting with all of this. So sometimes things don't work uh, immediately. You might need to reload the page a couple of times, uh, but you can. Uh, force things on by the command line flags, for instance. Um, and, in, and something that's cool in Chrome is you have this net view. A lot of the time when things don't quite work as you would expect, uh, what you'll hear us ask is, can you provide the net log? So you want to go into Chrome uh, net export to first enable logging to a file. But then once you've got that file, you can um, send it to somebody, say, and say, look, can you have a look at this, please? And you can even import those files into the QViz tool I showed earlier to have it plot everything out for you. So you can start to see some of the things. Uh, but to summarize, there's a lot of information there. I do appreciate it was a, a blast and I probably didn't cover a lot of the things uh, we'll get onto in, in any questions you might have the time for now, uh, but that you know, Quick and HB3 are open standards developed in the IETF using a GitHub workflow. Uh, there's many open source implementations and many other useful tools uh, that help support um, the development and uh, testing and analysis of both Quick and HP3. Um, and there's a final point here that got cut off. So we'll leave it to the imagination about what that was supposed to say and quickly move on to the questions. Thanks well, so much, Lucas. Thank that was awesome. Well, thank, thank you. I would say thank you for everyone for making the time to, to watch me today. And I'm always available on Twitter if you want to tweet me. Um, but yeah, should we hit some questions? Yes, we have loads of them. Uh, first off, how much faster is HTTP3 from HTTP2? That's a great question. I think um, it's it's too hard to answer right now. Uh, as always, people want to say, look, it's going to be X percent faster or, or N times as, as better. But realistically, um, it, the answer is going to be it depends. And I know that's not something that people like to hear, but it does. Like these uh, different aspects of, of protocol technology are dependent on the characteristics of the network that they're running on. Uh, so it does require maybe some more work from a server to do HP3 or quick. But for certain kinds of networks that experience a lot of loss, that can um, immediately give you some performance gains. But how do you measure performance? If you're loading web pages, you might want to look at um, the different kind of core web vitals that are out there now, or, or the different um, metrics that you might already be using for your web, web development. If you look at just things like raw time to first byte or download times of, of document like things, that's okay. But if you do that without multiplexing, then uh, it, it's maybe not a super accurate way. And so I think the research community even is still trying to figure out fair and effective ways of comparing the performance between uh, TCP and Quick and TCP and TLS and Quick and these different kinds of things. Um, you'll see there's different papers out there looking at comparing G-Quick, say, to HB2 before, and those things are okay. Um, things are different today. And so, yeah, this is a long-winded way of saying, um, I don't have those numbers to give to you today. I don't think anyone who says that they can is speaking definitively, to be honest. I would say the important thing is to measure and create a framework for being able to measure those things first, and that HP3 and Quick definitely provide the opportunity for improved performance. But don't be surprised if right now we don't have that because the, the software is still getting tuned. TCPs had many years of being tuned. Um, so don't be disheartened if it's not quite there, but also to, to measure and feedback to people who are actively working on this. The only way that we know how things perform for your particular use cases um, or, or makeup of a web page is, is for people to try it out themselves. And that's why getting the deployments and the running code in this phase is going to be so important 
So yeah, exciting times. Great. Two slightly related questions. Number one, is HTTP3 backward compatible with HTTP2? And two, as a web app developer, should I expect the code that I write on both sides, client and server, to just work as usual so that the work required to switch to HTTP3 and quick is done by only setting up the HTTP server and the browser? Uh, yeah, those are really excellent questions. And actually, um, I realize I probably should have put that in the slides. Uh, so I'll factor that in for next time. Uh, I think we can add it to the slides later, Lucas. I will. I'll go away. This is it. It's about getting feedback and incorporating and iterating. You know, this is open standards and open communication development. Uh, but no, no, to be more serious, you know, a big, um, a big part of the HTTP2 development was to maintain compatibility. Right? There's no point um, going off and developing something that's so like alien and different that it. Okay, yeah, it could be better, um, but it's going to require everyone. In the ecosystem to to up sticks and move to something that's different we need to be aware that people have speciality and time in different aspects of things and you know there's a whole community of, of people who are building value on top of the web that don't necessarily care about the version that's happening underneath yes if it can provide improvements fantastic but if it requires me to spend two years to completely change the stack and to run two different stacks and process Oh, in parallel, that, that's not a good place to be. So um, this comes back to the, the earlier part of the talk of, of maintaining the idea of HTTP semantics so that things like requests and responses are common across all versions of HTTP. There might be some details about, oh, when I make this kind of request, it works slightly differently. But ultimately, if you're building like a web page, um, you, you don't need to worry. You just know that uh, if I have this like, hyperlink or this document that's pulled in via a source element say the web browser is going to handle the details for me it might try h2 it might try h3 it might be on a network where udp is blocked for some reason um, or you know ipv6 isn't supported so that's the browser's job is to abstract away all of that information from from developers and to to do their own kind of heuristics and performance tuning to understand when might be a good time to use a protocol or not. And so a common question I get for this is, can I, if I'm using like the JavaScript fetch API, can I select the version of HTTP that I want? Because I want to try HTTP3. Um, and the answer there is no, because the browser handles that for you. That can be a bit annoying if you precisely know what you want to do, but the value is that then you don't need to worry. But on the server perspective, you know, um, I mentioned Nginx. Like for instance, here what we have is uh, a range of modules that support different HTTP versions. So Nginx is going to take the the problem of of figuring out the version during the handshake for you, and at some point turn that into its its object model view of what HTTP request is, so that when you have maybe some server side configuration or you're passing it on to you know, something like a CGI module, or you want to pass it on then to a node server that's running behind the, the proxy, say. Um, you can do those things because you're still just talking request and response. Although the bits on the wire might be different, you still have headers, you've got payload data. Um, generally, all of these things just work. So it's backwards compatible in the sense that um, you shouldn't need to worry too much. It's not backwards compatible on the wire, you won't be able to like copy those bytes on the wire in H2 and just send them to a H3 endpoint. Like that's where it would fail. And that's why a tool like Wireshark say it's still implementing support for H3 because there's some of those subtle differences. Thank you. And I'm so sorry that we're run, we're, we've run out of time when it comes to questions. We'll see if Lucas can help us answer some of them and perhaps we can potentially send out a link afterwards with some of the answers. Um, Lucas, any final words of wisdom for the audience before we sign off here? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I've got lots of words of wisdom and I don't want to waste people's time. So I'll just say uh, <laughs> thank you very much for your time. And apologies if I didn't get to answer a question. Um, I did plan a shorter talk, but I just kept finding little details that were uh, interesting for people to know. So yeah, sure, if people have got questions and I can answer them in some way, um, I'll try my best to do it. And if you don't get one, again, just 
hit me on Twitter and I'll answer what I can. I'm, I'm just one person here. I don't speak for the community. Um, you know, there might be other people with different answers and that's something to bear in mind, but um, I'd like to, to hope I can at least get you started on a path. Thank you so much, Lucas, and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. We hope to see you again on a Digital Ocean Tech Talk. Thank you and have a great week. Happy coding.